we should start yeah. if it's recording. Yeah. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. So yet, right now, we're going to start the day with this uh, lecture on how to write a translator uh, to the Dutch. So I'll be sharing this lecture with uh, Jasper here. And yeah, I think you know him. <laughs> uh, maybe before starting, just some comments. So this is a one hour and a half lecture. So <laughs> please interrupt me at any time if you have questions or if you think that what I'm saying is false or something. I mean, just interrupt me, please. And also, uh, well, this is techni technically a lecture, but I think that this is a bit of fake news because <laughs> uh, there, uh, I think that, I, well, I mean, I hope that you learn very, a lot of things with this lecture, but I think that at the end, uh, we don't have perfect uh, answers for everything. So uh, I, uh, it's lots of, ongoing work at the same time, but other things we know more or less uh, better how to do. So yeah, this is also a discussion, I guess. Okay, so okay, so on previous talks, uh, for instance, on Jill talk, you saw how to define theories in the duct and how in these theories to write some proofs. So for instance, you saw the theory U with uh, Jill yesterday. So the goal of this talk is uh, rather how to, to, to see how we can write automatic translators from proof assistants and yeah, which allow us to, to then translate such proofs automatically into a theory that we will define in the duct -tie. So uh, yeah, this lecture, the name is how to write a translator into the duct -tie, but of course that I haven't wrote all translators for all proof assistants, so I cannot teach you the general all, all the problems that you find, but I, I hope I'll be able to give some general principles and also to do a case study of the Agda to the Duct translator. So in Agda, we have a bunch of features that we usually find on type theory proof assistants. So I think that there are a lot of things there who can be reused if you're ever interested in writing, for instance, the translator from Lean to the Duct, which we still don't have, so it would be interesting. Uh, okay, so this is the roadmap. Uh, yeah, like I said, I'll first talk about the general principles and then we'll go a bit more on what is Agnea and how to encode the different uh, things uh, in it, uh, in the Dexy, sorry. Uh, so yeah, so this is the general recipe. <laughs> so uh, these are more or less like the steps that you would follow to to do it. So. The step zero, which I'm putting at zero because it's not evident that this would be something that you would have to do, is to actually find uh, a, a system, so really a formal system, so you can have the, the deduction rules and everything that corresponds to the proof assistant logic. And that's actually not that easy. I mean, uh, for instance, I, I, I guess that for Coq, for, for instance, we can have many uh, definitions of the underlying logic in different papers and sometimes you're not sure of what really corresponds to it. And for, 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 for the case of Agda, it's similar. So you end up like looking at all the documentation and trying to like re, uh, redo the, 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 the rules on your head and like trying to merge all the information that you get from the articles. So yeah, this is not, uh, 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 this is a step that you, st you still have to make. It's not something that there's that will probably be already for you. So once you have this clear in your head or in a piece of paper, then the, the following step would be to then define a deductive theory. So just to recall, uh, Gilles explained to us, or I think, no, sorry, Frederick explained to us yesterday what is a deductive theory. So it's a couple, we have a signature, so a signature is uh, a set of, or a sequence, like you, there's a matter of, uh, of constants and the types of these constants. And you also have a set of free writing rules. So just to recall, these are untyped free write rules, but we ask them after to be uh, type preserving, but the rules it themselves are, are untyped. So you cannot, for instance, match on the type or things like that. And this is what we call uh, a, a deductive theory. So the goal here uh, of this first step is to define a theory that will express the logic 
the object logic of this proof assistant that we're trying to encode. So I'm using this notation uh, D, uh, D of O, so D of deductive, of course. Okay, and this, so you should be able to define a theory somehow, and, uh, and then you should be able to define a translation, so a map that will take you from the terms of this object logic to the terms of the framework, in particular in the, the theory that we've just defined on step one. So this pair is what we would usually call an encoding. So you have the theory and the translation function. Uh, so this is the theoretical work. And if you get, got until here, then now you need to, to, uh, to really do something hands-on and start implementing things uh, if you don't want to translate things by yourself. So you, uh, one of the approaches that we normally have is to uh, reuse some of the proof assistant code. So you should be able to reuse some of the terms that in, are in the internal syntax. So you don't have, for instance, to, uh, to read an ACDA file and then redo all the elaboration for yourself. Uh, I'm not going to explain this very well now, but uh, yeah, Jesper will explain it when talking about the implementation of ACDA to the DUCTI. So yeah, but the, the general idea is to try to reuse some of the, the APIs and the tools offered by the proof assistant so to make this uh, step easier. Okay, so just uh, a little note here. Uh, I told you what is uh, encoding, but not encodings are, not all encodings are created equal. So we have some criteria that uh, some of them are not always attainable, but it's good to have this image of like, what are the properties that we might uh, want. So what we call soundness, it's basically the property that we always want to have. Uh, the fact that if we have a certain judgment in this object logic or the logic of the proof assistant, then when I'm encoding it on the duty, I want it to be able to preserve the typeability relation. Of course, it would be very annoying if I have a proof on the, that I'm translating that is correct, everything is well, and then I put in the duct and the duct complains, so we don't want that, of course. Then we have the converse, the fact that the encoding is conservative, so to understand why we're using the word conservative here, you should probably think of A not as a type, but maybe as a proposition. Well, <laughs> if you don't, well, if you, I mean, you can say that's always the same thing, or there is an embedding, or I mean. <laughs> but the idea is that if you have a proof of A on your encoding, then you want your encode to be conservative, so the theory that you started with should also be able to, to prove A. So this is the, the, this criteria. And at the very uh, top, so if you've uh, worked a bit with uh, 12 and uh, LF, uh, like logical framework, so probably you have been a bit, you know this criteria of adequacy, so we would ask the translation function to be a compositional bijection between the object type and the encoded type. So composition here just means that you, the substitution of the uh, object logic is represented by the one of the framework, so you have this commutation. I'll not really get into the details, but just to uh, to, to mention this, uh, yeah. But generally, in deductive, we don't we we don't we aren't that strict. I mean, uh, if your encoding is sound and conservative, then it's uh, you already be able to see that everything that you that you type check is correct, and if something is correct, then you can type check it. So we, we don't always need it just to, to be able to, 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 to so j just to, to, to mention this uh, criteria. Okay, so uh, like I mentioned, I'm not able of to, to talk of every uh, problem that you face when uh, encoding proof assistance uh, in the DUCTI, but uh, there are some families, uh, some main features that we can find in some and not the others, and well, and the dif the difficulty of encoding the, the the language of those proof assistants also going to depend on on the features that we have. So, for instance, we can have dependent types as we have in all type theoretic proof assistants, or also inductive types which can come in different flavors. 
you're like in uh, Agda, you have inductive recursive, and if you're all type theory, uh, proof assistant have like, I think also inductive families, but not on simply typed uh, proof assistants. Then you also have universe polymorphism, which we'll talk uh, about here uh, also, that you have in also proof, proof, type theoretic proof assistants. Then you also have impredicativity, which is uh, very uh, omnipresent in everything as, except in Agda, which is, uh, I think, is the only proof assistant that's being used now, which is not impredicative. And I think, uh, yeah, on epigram, but epigram is, is not being developed anymore. So it's a bit, but it's used to be predicative. And you also have types of, of eta equality. So this can be only eta for the uh, arrow type or for general record types. But this can, and irrelevance and definitional proof irrelevance, which is the same kind of problem, basically. And these are present in different shapes in different proof systems. So this is more the difficulty of encoding the, the theoretical part uh, of yeah, this is the, the difficulties of really defining the, the encoding, but there are also uh, some difficulties in implementing it. Uh, so if you're writing a, a, a translator from a system based on Curry Howard or on also yeah, type theory, and then it's uh, generally easier because you already have a notion of proof terms and generally you can find them on the internal syntax. So you just need to look there and, and to translate them. Sometimes you have some information who won't be there. So in Agda, we'll see that this is a, a bit the case for sometimes. So you need to reconstruct it uh, yourself. But it, it's generally easier than, for instance, uh, proof assistants like Isabel and HOL, in which uh, you don't really have this notion. And you have, uh, you really have to reconstruct the, the proof term from the, the, the proof derivations that are not represented at, as terms internally. Uh, well, terms of, I don't know, OCaml, but not of terms of the, the language. Uh, yeah, as, as you know, in, in deductive, ev ev everything are, are terms, or proofs are terms. So this is something that we have to do. And actually, there's even other cases which are even more uh, radical, so we'll see a, a bit uh, we'll see after the, the talk of Gabriel, who talk about PVS. And actually, in PVS, the proof derivations are not even uh, available on the internal syntax. So, I mean, it's really <laughs> a different kind of beast, and you have to, to look for other solutions. So, yeah, you see that the implementation will also depend on, on the family of, of, of the proof system. So, yeah, today we'll look more in the case of Agda, so I'll We'll stay more on the on the first point here, but yeah, th th there are also some translators that we have from Isabel or HOL, and they are on this the second family. Okay, so now I will call the specialist here who will explain to me what Agda is and to you too. Great, yeah. Um, so I'm taking over here. So Tiago gave a like, um, a general introduction to this. Uh, kind of problem we want to solve. So um, in this talk, yeah, we're going to look specifically into Agda. And so I'm not going to assume that all of you are very familiar with Agda. So in, I think, just three or four slides, I'll try to give a, a general idea of what, the, what Agda is and what the uh, theory behind this. Um, so what, it, what is Agda? It's a uh, dependently typed programming language and proof assistant. Um, so compared to uh, Coq, it's, uh, it's a bit more heavy on the side of uh, programming language, but, uh, yeah, but you can use it as both, uh, based on uh, well, Martin Left type theory. Um, so it has uh, a bunch of features. So uh, it uh, relies quite heavily or, uh, on uh, index data types and dependent pattern matching. So that's really the primary way in which you write both programs and proofs in Agda is by uh, defining data types or index data types and pattern matching on them. Um, and it has 
uh, yeah, it has uh, explicit universe polymorphism. So that's a bit of a difference if you're used to the more implicit style of universe polymorphism in Koch. Uh, you really have to explicitly quantify over universe levels if you want your definitions to be uh, universe polymorphism. And we'll, uh, we'll talk more about that later. Um, and then maybe the uh, most interesting part is the conversion, right? So, I mean, interesting part of any proof system. Um, so it, of course, uses uh, beta equality. Uh, um, but then it also has uh, rather strong forms of uh, eta equality. So eta equality both for functions and record types. And uh, in particular, it supports eta equality for the unit type as well. Uh, and it also has a very strong form of uh, definitional proof irrelevance. So you can uh, define proof objects to be definitional proof irrelevant so that any two uh, proofs are identified. Um, so I think uh, from the point of view of uh, writing a translator from Agda to Deducti, this is the very high level summary. Um, oh yeah, and I forgot to write it on this slide, but Tiago already mentioned this is a predicative language so you do not support in predicativity. Um, so maybe it's easier with a, a small example, right? So here's uh, two examples of data types in Agda. So uh, the first one is just uh, well, uh, this joint union type or some type. Um, and uh, so this is defined as a data type with two parameters of type set. So those are two types. Uh, it's, it's called set for historical reasons instead of type. But, uh, um, and then it has uh, two constructors. So either we give an element of type A or with the left constructor, an element of type B with the right constructor. Um, so this is a, a simple data type, but then I mentioned index data types are also heavily used uh, quite often in Agda. Uh, and so the second one here is an example. So this is a data type that represents proofs that one natural number is uh, less than another one. Uh, so we have two indices uh, of type not. And then there's two constructors. So the first one says that the number zero is always less than any, or less than or equal to any number n. And the second one says that if m is less than or equal to n, then their successors are also related. Um, so, um, so, so this is, I mean, so you really use the same mechanisms for defining uh, data types and uh, proof objects, basically. Um, so yeah, one, one small remark, I, oh, sorry. I declared this to be in a set, uh, as you can see here. So I could also have declared this to be in prop and that would mean it's, uh, would make it uh, proof irrelevant, right? So then uh, any two proofs should be uh, identified. Um, so there is a choice to make there, right? So if you want to do really proof relevant mathematics, you can declare it in sets like this. If you want it to be irrelevant, you can declare it in prop. Okay. Then uh, how do you actually uh, write proofs on these uh, or functions or proofs on these types? Uh, well, we can uh, use uh, pattern matching, right? <coughs> and uh, here's a small example of a proof in Agda. So we're proving that for any two numbers, M and N, uh, well, the either uh, M is less than or equal to N or N is strictly uh, less than N. So that is the ordering is total. Um, and yeah, so the way we prove this is by pattern matching on the numbers. Uh, so we have uh, three cases. So either the first number is zero. Uh, in that case, we can use the, the left proof. Um, in the second case, well, we have uh, the, the first number is a successor and then the second number is either zero, in which case we can use right. Um, and then finally, in the third case, we have to make a recursive call. So I'm using this uh, width construct here to be able to pattern match on the uh, output of the recursive call, right? So we're checking if M and or how, what's the relation between M and N by making this recursive call and then we pattern match on the result. So either we get a uh, proof that M is, M is less than or equal to N and then we just uh, continue with the left proof. Otherwise uh, we give a right proof. Um, 
And yeah, so note that um, we, we can uh, be quite uh, flexible in how we do uh, induction, right? So this is not, uh, not just, I mean, we're kind of doing induction on both of the arguments at once. Uh, also, there is uh, termination checking happening uh, behind the scenes, of course, to make sure that this is this is well founded. Um, but um, so okay, I think uh, is this clear how this works for everyone? Yeah, good. Um, and then. Uh, yeah, so a bit more behind the scenes of Agda, right? So we uh, mentioned today we have this explicit uh, universe polymorphism. Um, so uh, what does this mean? Well, at, this, at its core, uh, Agda is really a kind of a pure type system. Um, so that uh, means well, we have the, the sorts of Agda. These are these types uh, set L. Well, we also have prop L, but uh, I'm ignoring those for now. So um, you have a set L and for, for each uh, universe level L, we have uh, a universe, right? Um, and so we can actually define these things uh, internally. So we can define for each level L, uh, we can define well, this type set L, which has type set of successor of L, right? Um, and we can also define a kind of a product type, so function type from, or dependent function type from A to B, right? And that has um, the type, which is the, the maximum of the two levels. So assuming that A has type is at level L1 and B is at level L2. Um, point of view. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm just, uh, yeah, you can just use set, right? Okay. I'm, I'm just showing that. Uh, that if you write set, then this has type uh, uh, set L, this has type set successor L. I just wanted to show you. Yeah. There's, um, there's not really a, a reason for this. Is, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and uh, so maybe let me also quickly uh, show you the, the demo file. Oh, sorry. Uh, that we're, I wanted to use for this um, for this talk, right? So I'll, I'll come back to this later, but uh, just um, to show you, um, so I'll show you later what kind of output we get from this uh, from this file. Um, so I just have a bunch of uh, well, small test cases here, I would say. Um, so we have this uh, disjoint union type that I showed and. Uh, then type and uh, this compare function um, and then oh yeah so we'll, we'll come back to this example later so this is um, example using universe polymorphism yeah, so, um, right so but this actually checks as a as an agda file you might need to make it a bit larger making it a bit larger yes uh, like this Okay, yeah. Um, so, everything clear on what is Agda? Uh, so, this, this is what we're starting from, and now uh, I think Tiago is going to come back and uh, talk about how we can actually uh, encode this uh, theory in deductive. Yeah. Um, so it depends, right? So you can define the identity type in set, which means that it is proof relevant, right? And that's the standard definition that you get in Agda. Um, you could also define the identity type in, in prop, right? Um, so this will limit, uh, this will give you uniqueness out of identity proofs for that type, uh, but it will also limit how you can eliminate the identity type. So by default, you will not actually be able to prove um, prove uh, substitution or J for this uh, proof irrelevant type. So you do not have uniqueness of identity proofs by default, but you can postulate it uh, if you want. Yeah. Uh, 
Oh. <clears throat> okay, so I continue on the encoding. Now that you know what AGDA is, we'll see how we can encode it. And actually, we'll do this a uh, bit step by step because, uh, so yeah, Ag uh, Jasper explained that at its core, AGDA is also a pure type system. So we we'll start a bit by, uh, by trying to see how we can express this, so in particular, how we can express the universes. So, Pure type systems are just type system in which we have two kinds of types. You have universes and arrows, and this is what we are going to start to look at. And then, as you see, we have a look into more advanced features such as inductive types, universe polymorphism, and eta equality. So yeah, so this we have uh, a definition of the terms of AGDA and. Uh, here I'm trying to uh, to define the translation function, and I'm, I'll, I'll try to do this uh, at the same time I'm defining. So yeah, when you're defining the uh, uh, the theory, of course that you should be doing it while you're thinking of how you would define the translation function. So finally, step two and three, I think, or one and two are interleaved. So this is what we're going to do here also. So uh, we start with. Uh, variables and symbols and constructors, those are easy. We can just represent them. So the variables, they're mapped to variables of the uh, of the ducty. And uh, as you know, we can also declare constants in the ducty. So for this, we use uh, we can use this to represent defined symbols and constructors. And there's also, not in this list, but there, we also have the type formers, so net and, and list and which would also be translated as, as constants. Uh, okay, and let's try to continue then. So uh, we- well, One small remark that for the constructors, uh, Agda supports uh, constructed overloading, which the Ducty does not support. Uh, so each time we use a constructor, we need to qualify it using the, the name of the data type. Right? So we would not have just successor, but not a double underscore successor. Okay, Thank, thanks for the remark. <laughs> I forgot to mention it. Uh, yeah, but then for uh, Lambda and application, so the way that we usually, well, that we do in the directory, we like to translate them also as Lambdas and applications of the framework. So this is what I'm doing here, and to understand how this will type check, we'll, we'll have to wait a little bit. But then we also have, of course, the, the, the types. We have the, 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 the pi type and we have the universes. So how, uh, how, can we, uh, how can we encode them? So first, we have to have a discussion about universes. So if you're using a proof assistant, then you're most familiar with, I guess, Russell style universes. So if I have a type who lives in a, in a sort, in a universe like set L, then uh, A is the type itself, so I can have, for instance, if I have NAT, which is in set zero, then I have zero, which is also in, uh, in NAT. So the, 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 the elements of the source and of the universe are typed themselves. Well, this is it's, it's not the case in the Dutch, as we saw yesterday. We don't have universes, we have type, and, and, and that's it. We also have another one, which is which we don't see and it's just there for theoretical uh, reasons, but uh, so we cannot really do this. So if you have set, which is of type type in the duct, and you have A, which is of type set, then you cannot have little A, it's of type big A, it's like Jill mentioned yesterday. So what we do in the duct is we use a form of Tarski style universes. So elements of uh, of, uh, of set will be rather codes that will then have to be interpreted into types. So here I have uh, C, which is in U of set L. I explain a bit more what this is after, but then, uh, then yeah, this U of set L is the type that is encoding uh, set L of so this universe. And then this C, I, 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 it also corresponds to a type because it, it was come from uh, in, in, in Agda, this would be s some type in set L. So I need to map it to a type so I can declare things inside it. So to do this, we have uh, this OL, which will map the codes to the types. 
and then we can declare elements into this type. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, so this is the beginning of our of our theory. So we start at the very beginning by declaring a type for sorts, uh, and right now, uh, so Agda also have some other sorts, but for now we only look at the set hierarchy. So we have a set for each universe level. And for now, I'm not going to say how to represent universe levels. I'm going to postpone this, but for now you can just think of them as natural numbers, uh, as an encoding of natural numbers, which is something that uh, I leave as an exercise for you to do in the DEX here. It's not hard. <laughs> and uh, okay, so this set I for a sensor I represents the, the, the source, but then I also want it to be a, a type so I can put codes into this type. And this is the role of this big U. So for each sort, I'm also embedding it into the type of the framework so I can put codes into it. So for instance, I would have uh, net, which is uh, a code in of U of set zero. And then if I want to declare zero, uh, d add the constant zero, I cannot say that zero is of type net, as I just said. Rather, I would say that zero is of type OL of set zero and net. So this OL allows us to take codes that are in the sort, the, the, in, the, in this big U, and to map them to, to real types. What would be an example of the sort? Uh, would be like set I for any I, so yeah. And uh, yeah, so Jasper mentioned that at score Agda is a PTS, so we also have to declare, uh, so a PTS is specified by uh, a set of sorts, uh, a binary re relation on axioms and a trinary relation on roles, but for now we're going to assume, uh, I mean, it's easier this way if, if they're like, and this is the case in, in Agda, that they're uh, functional and, and, and full, so, uh, so we can just declare them as, as functions. Uh, and this is better to, to do things, it's easier. So right now I'm specifying here the, uh, what this axiom is. So for instance, for each sort set i, the sort that's over it is the sort i plus one or successor of i. And for the rule, this is similar. So the, you know, when, when you, you're doing, uh, uh, defi when you're taking the arrow type in Agda of types that in, are in sort i and sort j, then this will end up in the max of them. So this is what this is saying. And we, we use this later, as you will see. So yeah, this is, this is encoding the specification of the Agda PTS. And we, yeah, right now we're not using, but we'll use this later, as we'll see. Sorry? Uh, yeah, so right now uh, we're not encoding propositions and as we'll see for now we don't handle a definition proof irrelevance on on our translation. So I mean we co could always add the prop hierarchy but it would like for a, an arbitrary proof it would probably not take check because you might use definition proof uh, irrelevance and as this is not represented you would just get an error. So yeah, for now I'm just focusing on Basic Agda, you only have the set hierarchy, and yeah. So are you saying that it's not implemented at all, or that you're just not showing it here? No, yeah, uh, it's not. We don't have yet a good way to represent definitional proof relevancy in uh, relevance in in the dictionary. So this is is not only a, a technical problem; it's also a theoretical one. So yeah. Okay, so. Uh, so now, okay, I had postponed then the, the definition of the, of the pi types. So what we want here is to have a constant that for each uh, code in U of S A, and well, this is a dependent arrow, so this B here it will map each element of A to uh, a, a new element in this, uh, to a new code in S B. So this is uh, what you should, you should think of this arrow uh, as, as really saying that this U, this element of U as B is defined in a context in which you extend with, with an element of type A. So 
This is what Jill mentioned yesterday. This is high order abstract syntax. And then this should land, so you should add, get at the, the end prod of this, so this is just the pi. And as now we are using the rule that we defined just after, uh, just before, sorry. And this is the new universe that you, you are arriving. So, uh, yeah, so once I have declared this constant, uh, uh, I still don't have anything that, any, any type, uh, I'm sorry, when I, I take the OL of this, of this code for, for a type, then I still don't have anything that lives on it, but I would like to have abstraction so I can create a type, uh, a term into this type, and also application so I can take uh, an abstraction, take a, a thing for an arrow type and use it. So uh, I could declare constant for constructor and destructor, and which would correspond to abstraction application. But what we do rather here is that we're going to add uh, a, a rule that will allow us to identify the, this object arrow that we're encoding with the framework arrow. This way uh, we can use the lambda of the framework to represent the lambda of the theory and the same for application. Uh, so this is what we do here. And what we get is this encoding here. So we're back to uh, real deductive code. So this is, I'm declaring the constant that I just explained, which is going to represent the, the pi types. And I'm also uh, adding this rewrite rule, which is going to identify the, the, my representation for object arrows to the uh, arrows of the duct. So as I said, this is used for me to type check the fact that when I, that I can use a lambda of the duct to represent uh, a lambda of, of, uh, of the theory. So this is also, Gil explained this yesterday. I'm just uh, in a more complicated setting, but yeah, it's the same principle. So you saw here that, uh, so when you write pi, I, usually, I, I suppose that you only write pi of x uh, to point a dot b, or something like that. You don't write the s a and the s b, but in the deck we are really explicit. You, we need this information to type things. So you, you, you see here that I really need this, the s a and the s b, which are the source of a and b. So uh, fortunately in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Agda, we internally we can retrieve the source on the internal synthesis. So this is something that we we also discuss a bit more when talking about the implementation. But uh, this is really convenient because this is an information that we need and we can find it on uh, inside Agda, uh, Agda type checker. Yeah. So for instance, we have some examples here. So the, the sort of not is set, but then the the sort of uh, of set. So set lives in set one. So this is what this saying. Uh, which so this I, I hope it helps to illustrate the axiom uh, function that we defined just before. And then we have the arrow type. So the arrow type of set one. Uh, uh, so yeah. So set one lives in set of two, and set lives on set of one. So you're taking the max of them, and you end in, in set two. This is maybe a bit confusing, but you have to remember that you're actually looking at the types of, of set one. You're not looking at the index of, of one, you're looking at the type of it. Uh, okay, so now we have an answer for this part here. We now know we can just put prod and then we have the encoding of, this, of the sort of A and the encoding of the sort of B. Then we put A here and like I said, we're using higher order abstract syntax. So to represent the binder of the of, of the pi type, we're using the uh, abs uh, abstraction. And then here, I'm also adding uh, an encoding uh, of sorts. So we have this, the representation of sorts, and just after we'll see the representation of sorts as terms, but this is just uh, the, the, the basic representation which lives on the type sort, which is the, type, the first type that we had defined. And here I just translated as expected, so I had this constant set, so I just put set, and then I have this encoding of levels, which I'll also postpone uh, 
and then I, I just I just do this, so this is a bit expected. So n let's see how uh, what I can put here for the translation of universe as terms. Uh, so we already saw that we can represent, uh, we have a type for source and we also have this big U uh, uh, here, which is, which is a type when, when I apply it to it. But actually I, have, I want to have something that is a, really a term and that lives on an ACDA type. So how we, how we do this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What is the benefit of defining this with where instead of where? So when you yeah. say where, it's like a part of the rule that you want to define there, right? Yeah, actually, I'll also use this uh, elsewhere, but I'm, I'm just saying that like this is an, an another encoding function which I'm uh, I'm specifying at the same time, but like it's it's I could have defined it before everything. Uh, okay, so you could make it a separate deductive rule, rewrite rule, whatever, but there is no benefit. Uh, I'm sorry, th th this is not a rewrite rule. Uh, this is just the definition of the translation function. Uh, maybe I, this was a bit of a confusing part, I don't know, but this, I'm just defining the, the translation function. These are not rewrite rules. So when I... Uh, you define pi with the rewrite. Oh, yeah, yeah. When I define pi, I, I, I yeah. But, so I, I I don't think I, I I got your question then I'm sorry. Okay. So what is this where set L equals whatever? What's the point of the where? Uh, I, I mean I could just lift this and, and put at the very beginning and and, and defining so I mean, the 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 a yeah the the point is that these are defined only for sorts. So this is the translation of of terms, uh -huh. and this is the translation of sorts. So this is only defined for sorts. And because they have also this different representation in which they live on this type sort. So uh, yeah, I need to separate a bit the things because uh, on PTS is everything like it's mixed and like sorts are also terms, but I, I need to start somewhere so I have some typing information and then I can put the terms. But uh, I have this initial representation of only sorts and these are the things that will live on this type. Is it clear? So you have an operation class, single class, yeah. which goes from elements of source to to uh, elements of this type here. I think the, the reason why it's a bit confusing is because exactly because Arta doesn't make this distinction between set L and the elements of type set L. Right? So set L is Term in our term, right? And that's so the terms we are interpreting with the double brackets. Um, but yeah, but the set L is also a sort in our term, right? And uh, sorts we are interpreting with these uh, vertical bars and stuff. Yeah. So so we have to do uh, a bit of disambiguation. So depending on where it is used, we're using a different translation, basically. And, uh, and, and we need, we cannot do the same interpretation because in the deductive translation it's actually ending up in different sorts, right? There's either a sort or a, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, that's, <laughs> th thanks for, for help. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think I was here, yes. So, as I said, I also want a representation of sorts as terms of a, a certain ACDA type. So what I'm, I'll do here is for each sort, each element of the type sort, which are representing sorts, I add this this constant u, u little u, which will be mapping it to the this big u, which which is really a type. And as we know, when you're in, if you take the sort set, then we'll live in set one uh, or set two. If set one is well, if you take set one, then this will live in set two. And uh, the axiom here is the what we had defined before. So this means that u of set one will live in big U of set two, where the set two is also the the source representation. And the thing is that here we we end up with two representations for for some some sorts because uh, if I take for instance set two 
then it's also is represented as an element of, uh, as a code of, of sets. So yeah, if I have u of set one, by, by looking here, it will also be a code of u of set two. So when I apply ol to it, I'll have a type, but I also have a type corresponding to set two when I only write u of set two. So we have something that's, that we need to identify here. And once again, we're going to use rewrite rules. So we're just going to add this rule saying that those are actually the same thing. Uh, this is also similar when we uh, are defining uh, universes in Martin Love type theory and we, we also add codes of universes inside universes and then we identify them. No, it's just saying that you can put anything on it. So I, I could put here axiom of S, but uh, the, the thing is, is that for each well-typed instance of the left-hand side, this will always be convertible to axiom of S, you see? So I, I don't really need to, to put anything here. Can you say again, what was axiom, what is axiom of S? So yeah, axiom of S, so this corresponds to the to the axiom of pure type systems. So we're mapping each representation of sort to the sort that's just over it. So if I'm, for instance, of set one, then by making axiom of set one, I'm going to set two. And I'm using this 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 function when defining the literal u here. Okay, so uh, so here I know what to do now. I just need to put u of uh, of the representation as a sort of set L, and this is this is what I just had here. So this is u of set L. So so this ends up this uh, the representation of the underlying PTS of Agda, and here we have defined the theory to represent universes and uh, and uh, dependent product types, arrow types. And we also have defined the, trans the translation function. Uh, but yeah, in Agda, we also have other things. We'll go a bit more in detail after, but we have uh, data types. So to represent data types, we'll just, uh, so for now, we're not considering parameters or indices, so just very basic ones. So I'm just going to represent this as as a as a as a constant as we, we had before. Uh, so we don't have the type formers here, but it will be the same as the constructors. And uh, for the constructors, this corresponds to this part here. So as uh, Jasper mentioned, we need to qualify the to put d uh, underscore c to 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 disambiguate different occurrences of c. And yeah, so. At the end, both type formers and constructors can be represented as constants in the duct And I, because, so here C is of type A. And when I translate A with this function here, so remember that this is going to give me a term. But because I want to declare something on A, then this is a term I cannot do it directly. I need to lift it to a type using the function OL to then say that DC is on this type. And for function definitions, so for, for now, we have no pattern matching at all, so we're just basically aliases, more or less, and we, we just define uh, uh, a, a constant f. So here, uh, as uh, Frederick explained yesterday, we put the def, so this symbol can be later defined. And then we add a rewrite rule to re represent this clause saying that f of x, we're going to rewrite to the body of, of v. So we're going to be s to see this a little bit uh, more in details on the next part. Uh, after talking of the implementation of Agda to deductive, we'll also see how to represent general inductive types and dependent pattern matching. So I leave for now to Jasper. Great. OK, enough um, theoretical stuff for now. So let's see how to actually implement this, right? Uh, we want in the end have some, uh, some tool that works. Um, 
So how, how is this uh, Agda to Deducti implemented? Uh, well, it's actually making use of quite a bit of infrastructure of the implementation of Agda itself. And uh, in particular, it's implemented uh, using the backend mechanism for Agda, uh, which is also used for uh, many of the built-in backends, so for the Haskell backend, for the LaTeX backend, for the JavaScript backend, uh, as well as uh, other uh, external ones. Um, and, and the really nice part of implementing such a, a backend is basically that we can use all of Agda's type checker and I mean, the full implementation of Agda as a kind of a library uh, and use, reuse all the functions in there for implementing our translation to Deducti. So uh, in particular, there's two uh, very important parts that we will that we're making use of. So first of all, there's the internal syntax representation of Agda, which is a kind of a very desugared uh, representation of the surface syntax uh, using the brown indices and uh, where uh, yeah, most, I mean, many things have been uh, uh, translated away already. So this is more convenient. Uh, you can think of it as a kind of a core language for Agda, even though it's not uh, as well defined as uh, Cox core language. Um, and then uh, the second part we'll use is the type checking monad. So this is a monad that's used throughout the, uh, all of uh, Agda's code base. Um, so le let me show you um, yeah, how this uh, Agda type checker actually uh, works. So here's the overall picture um, of, uh, of how the Agda type checker is implemented. Um, so we start with an uh, Agda file, right? And this is first, well, lexed and parsed, and then we get some representation in the, what Agda calls the concrete syntax. So this is uh, not processed in any way yet. Uh, the next step is, well, there's some scope checking happening. So this uh, uh, will disambiguate any variable names and uh, make, uh, I mean, identify them as, uh, I mean, using some unique identifiers, right? So we know. Uh, we resolve any shadowing and such. Uh, then the next step, and I think the main step, is the, the type checking. So this elaborates this abstract syntax into the internal syntax of Agda. Um, and like I said, this sugars uh, a lot of things. Uh, and then finally, there's some uh, well, things more related to the backend. So we do some optimizations, uh, erase uh, proofs in prop and such, uh, which ends up in the so-called uh, treeless syntax because it also translates away most of the pattern matching uh, or the, the, the case trees. And then finally, you can run one of the backends on it. So for example, there's the Malonzo backend, which produces then a Haskell file, which you can compile using uh, GHC to get a, a binary. Uh, so if we have this picture, so where does then the Agda to Deducti backend come in? Uh, well, we're not really making use of this uh, treeless syntax and that, uh, anything that comes after. So we're basically branching off at, uh, at this point uh, when we have the internal syntax because that's the, well, the, the most convenient uh, place. It's the easiest language to, to encode. Um, I mean, if we would go later, then we would have erased too much information and we would have to reconstruct it. Uh, yeah, right. So. Uh, Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, um, okay, good. Um, so yeah, so here's the actual internal syntax and uh, this is the, the Haskell, actual Haskell implementation. Um, so there's a, a bunch of constructors here, but I think not too many. So I think it's pretty easy to recognize the uh, representation that Tiago showed on the translation, right? So we have uh, variables, we have uh, lambda instructions, we have uh, some literals such as, as numbers and strings. Um, we have uh, function or defined functions, uh, so the devs. Um, we have then uh, constructors also, we have pi types, we have, uh, we have sorts, we have uh, universe levels uh, in the internal syntax. And then there are some uh, things that are used mostly during the elaboration, but uh, are not very uh, important uh, for this uh, purpose, right? So we just assume that they are not uh, present in the, in the syntax that we're translating. Yes, a question. Yeah, the search on the variables, that would also function Yes, good question. So you notice that there's no constructor for function application. 
And uh, this is because uh, in this internal syntax, actually, this uh, enforced, this is always only representing beta normal forms. Uh, so in particular, uh, you notice these elims for the variables and for the defs and the cons. So these elims are basically a list of arguments that this uh, symbol is applied to. Right? So in particular, we cannot represent a uh, lambda abstraction applied to an argument. Right? So this is, uh, instead, this is eagerly uh, reduced away in the internal syntax. Uh, sometimes, yes, yes. So most of the time it's fine, but sometimes you want to, you, you lose some sharing. Uh, although, I mean, so since it is implemented in Haskell, Haskell has some, uh, some sharing, but uh, yeah, you have to be careful to preserve it. Yeah. Yeah, fingers crossed, exactly. So, but yes, so we, we do have some uh, performance problems uh, with this sometimes. So. Anyway, but this is, the, this is the syntax that we have at the moment. Yeah. Um, and then we have this uh, type checking monad. So this is used really in many places in the type checker, but um, I'll just show you a, a few of the functions that are defined there that will be useful for the translation. So uh, one, some of the things we can do, we can, well, if we have a name of uh, some defined symbol, we can ask for its uh, definition, which is get const info. Uh, we can also get the uh, definitions or of, of certain built-in functions. So like, uh, um, like I mean, there are some built-in functions like additional natural numbers, and uh, we can always uh, get get our uh, definition. This get built-in. We can also query the uh, context of the, so the current variables that are in scope, right, using this uh, get context function. And we can also add variables to the context, but only do this locally, right? So this add context allows us to give uh, another TCM operation that we want to run in an extended context. Uh, so it's not really stateful, it's only locally modifying this uh, context. So you can think of it as a, as a kind of a reader monad if you're familiar with that. Um, and then there's uh, uh, some well, uh, useful uh, functions as well. So we can actually rerun the type checker on a piece of internal syntax using this uh, check internal function. Um, so this doesn't uh, return anything. We'll just say yes or no if it's uh, fine. Uh, but uh, using this uh, check internal, there's also some uh, transformations that we can do on the, on the syntax. And uh, so in particular, one very nice one is uh, reconstruct parameters, but uh, I'll talk about, a bit more about that later. But they can uh, reconstruct some information that is, uh, uh, that is erased by the, in this internal syntax already. Yeah. Um, Right, and then we can put this all together, right? So we can uh, implement uh, the, the translation and then uh, run it uh, on, on, on some example. Uh, and I'm, I'm not gonna go over the full implementation, but I'll just show you the example here. Um, and uh, so here we have, we have this uh, a proof that, well, of this, uh, that one is less than or equal to two right, or two is less than one, but we're giving the left proof here. Um, and we have uh, the proof here, and then you uh, get uh, this uh, nice thing as, uh, as output. Um, so you'll notice that, well, okay, there's maybe, I think most of the things should be clear. So one, you'll see these uh, curly braces with the vertical bars. So this is because of the um, uh, very liberal naming rules in Agda, right? So. Uh, Agda allows a lot of uh, different names that deducti doesn't allow, but this is a way to escape those uh, characters, right? So this is a way to embed uh, all valid Agda names into uh, deducti. Um, so we're using those whenever it would otherwise not be a valid uh, name in deducti. Um, and then you'll also see that um, yeah, so that there's a lot of extra arguments that showed up here, right? So uh, for this less than or equal, for example, you see there's this uh, successor zero, successor, successor zero, uh, that don't really show up in the uh, term itself, right? I mean, and even the type itself, right? So this less than or equal, it's not an argument to left. So you might wonder where does that come from or where, why does that uh, show up there? 
Uh, and the answer is, of course, that we have already run the type checker on this. So Agda has actually elaborated the syntax. And these are uh, implicit arguments, but they become uh, explicit in the uh, internal syntax. Right? So this is uh, the work that well, we get for free. Agda already has done all the, the hard work for us. So we just, uh, just translate. Um, OK. So any uh, questions about this example? Is it clear how to uh, read this term? Uh, or? I, it's not clear to me. So it's one sim so the type symbol is applied to three things? The, it? This one? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's applied to three things in it. So in this syntax, it's only applied to one thing. But uh, there's two implicit arguments, basically, which are the two, uh, the two types, A and B. Right, so and these are the well, the less than or equal. So this this is this type, the first one. Uh, this one is is this type, the two strictly less than one, right? And then the third one, this is actually the less than or equal successor. Mm -hmm. And this one also has two implicit arguments. So these are uh, the two indices of the of the data type, right? So the zero and successor zero are the two indices. And then finally, this one has. Uh, has only one index because the other one was already fixed, yeah, right? So, and we had uh, that one is a success or zero, yeah. or is it just zero? Yeah. No, so yeah, success or zero. So, yes. Okay, yeah. Um, good. Um, okay, so yeah, this is how to translate terms, but uh, as Tiago mentioned, we don't just, just have terms in Agda, of course. We have to be able to translate uh, definitions as well. And in particular, we have uh, data types and uh, functions by uh, pattern matching. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, how to translate those. Right. So um, yeah, so first of all, uh, yeah, we have uh, data types and, uh, and their constructors, right? Um, so these are actually quite easy to translate to the DECT. The uh, reason is that, well, these are just uh, opaque uh, symbols. They do not have any, any reduction behavior. So they're basically, um, if you just look at them in isolation, they're just uh, constants, right? Um, and uh, so we can just translate them to constants in the DECT. Okay. So, um, but of course we have to, well, we have to give them a type, and uh, this type, well, we can get from Agda and then run the translator that we had for, for terms on it to get, uh, to get this uh, output. So if you take at this uh, less than or equal example, right, so then uh, we want to translate this, well, we get uh, three symbols, so we get the type itself and then the two constructors, um, and each of those are elements. So the first one is an element of this uh, function type from from set, uh, no, yeah, so yeah, you have to kind of ignore the first two arguments of prot because those are just the sort annotations. Uh, so, but this is a function type from natural numbers to another function type from natural numbers to set zero, right? So this is not to not to set zero if you uh, ignore all the annotations. Uh, and then the less than or equal zero, that's a uh, function type also from natural numbers uh, to, well, a proof that zero is less than or equal to n. Uh, and then finally, this one, you can read it as well, function type from natural numbers, or well, it takes two natural numbers, right? So the numbers m and n, and a proof that m is less than or equal to n, and then you get a proof that successors uh, are the same. Yeah that successor m is less than successor n, yes. Yes, indeed. So these are the unused arguments. I'm not sure why it adds the zero. You just could just write underscore, I guess. Yeah. Or, yeah. So, um, oh yeah, no, I, I know why it is giving, uh, adding the zero. Um, it's a bit of a technical detail. So. It's possible that this argument was not given a name in the Agda source code, but some of the implicit arguments that were inferred by Agda do use the argument. So even if it was not named in the 
in the function, we still have to give it a unique name so that we can use it for, for the implicit arguments. Yeah. Um, so, well, you notice, yeah, you're asking because there's a lot of annotations being added. Um, it is actually not as bad as it looks here, right? So uh, a lot, we're adding a lot of annotations, but these are all just uh, sorts of these uh, types, right? And, and the sorts are usually uh, quite small expressions. So when you, when you have, even when you're adding uh, bigger expressions, the, the sorts remain uh, relatively small. So I, I think it's more or less linear, but I, I don't have a formal proof of this, but uh, is, is, hmm? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it. Uh, yeah. It's. It's, it's, it's linear, so I think it's just a constant factor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but maybe we can discuss uh, later. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this is... Uh, do uh, data types. Uh, then there's one uh, side note so relating to this reconstruct parameters that I mentioned earlier. Right? So if you have a constructor in uh, Agda, uh, there's actually an optimization in the internal syntax, which is that it does not store the values of the parameters of the data type. So these are, theoretically speaking, these are arguments that are implicit arguments to the constructor, but these are not stored uh, in the internal syntax. Uh, because we can always infer them from the from the type of this expression, right? so, and Agda uses a kind of uh, bidirectional rule where these are in inf uh, not in inference mode but in, in checked mode, so we can also always have the uh, type. Um, so uh, in the deducti representations, it's not possible. So we actually have to reconstruct these uh, implicit arguments for the parameters. Um, and this requires, well, because we get the parameters from the type, this requires a type-directed traversal of the uh, syntax. Um, uh, but uh, luckily, this is, I mean, also useful in other places already. So it was not the first time we needed to have uh, a thing like this. So uh, there's already a function in the Agda implementation that provides this functionality. So this is this reconstruct parameters. So all we have to do is just uh, call this function uh, before doing the actual translation, and we have access to all the arguments. So this is one of the nice benefits of uh, reusing uh, Agda as a library. Um, okay. And um, yeah, so just to uh, show, yeah, basically how this works. So uh, when we run the type checker, right, then uh, Agda will already infer these implicit arguments, right? So you'll see the, the zero and the one for this uh, less than successor and the uh, one for the less than zero, but the left does not get any implicit arguments yet. But then we run this uh, uh, reconstruct parameters and then we, it's, we also get the uh, extra arguments to this left constructor. And then that's what we uh, feed into the actual translation. Okay, so that's data type, so let's look at uh, function definitions next. And uh, <laughs> in particular at uh, functions by uh, pattern matching, right? And uh, so all these functions in, uh, in Agda are just defined by, well, but, uh, by a set of clauses, right? So each class can do some uh, pattern matching, some uh, case analysis. 
so there's there's a natural way to uh, represent this in uh, deductee, right, as a constant with a set of uh, rewrite rules. Um, and so, yeah, so that's uh, what uh, Agda to deductee is uh, currently doing. Um, so in particular for this uh, compare, uh, well, we're getting first the uh, type signature, right? So we're giving uh, two numbers uh, and then we're returning a proof that well, either M is less than or equal to N or N is less than M. Uh, and then you can see all the uh, clauses. So there's uh, three clauses in this definition, right? So you can see the first one where it's pattern matching on zero. And then the second and third one are pattern matching successor and then having a zero successor for the second argument. Um, and uh, so there's, there's maybe one uh, more curious thing which I haven't really explained, which is this this width thing here that uh, suddenly shows up, right? And uh, if you remember the definition of this compare function, I was using this width feature in uh, Agda. So you might wonder how to actually, how, how we have to think about how to encode this feature in uh, Deducti. Uh, but again, this is not really necessary because Agda already does a translation during the uh, elaboration, so to the internal syntax. And it represents these uh, width uh, constructs with, uh, by introducing an extra helper function. Right? And uh, so it just generates some name like this width 66 in this case uh, for this helper function and then just inserts a call to this, uh, to this helper function. So in the, in the full translation, um, maybe I, I can actually uh, show you uh, because it's even, it's a bit uglier than on, on this slide even. Uh, <laughs> But um, yes. Yes. We lost track of time, indeed. Um, okay. Uh, so I'll very quickly show you then a test of the case. Um, right. So this is the full output. You can see there's a few more qualifiers. Um, yeah, but so here you can see there, this is calling the width function. And then here's the actual, the full definition of this uh, helper function that's also there. Um, but okay, so since indeed we're, uh, we're a bit late, so I'm not gonna, uh, okay. So there's, there's some discussion. So Tiago is currently working on this. So it's translating uh, definitions by pattern matching to rewrite rules directly is not completely satisfactory. Uh, because that basically it means that each time we add a new function, we're extending the theory in a sense. That we're extending the theory that's encoding uh, Agda. And uh, it would be nicer if we could have one fixed theory of what is Agda that we do not have to extend each time we add a new uh, definition. Um, and uh, one of the, the reasons for this is, well, we want to be able to check the correctness of the generated Agda program. And uh, part of the correctness is the completeness of each function by pattern matching and the termination. And currently that's uh, very hard to check. So that would be, uh, would be, yeah. So because you have to do run some check on the rewrite rules. And uh, so Tiago is currently working on uh, instead uh, implementing the translation to eliminators that we also have in the equations package, for example, right? And uh, See, uh, and then just so then this definition would just be translated to the induction principle. Yes. Uh, just a sanity check. Uh, does this cover induction recursion and induction induction, uh, or you need to do something else uh, when you translate inductive to recursion? Uh, well, yeah. You can answer. Yeah, like the, the translation specification would, wouldn't cover it. You have to put it last. But I'm yeah. just curious. So the, the challenge is, well, the first challenge is you have to generate this induction principle, right? And, uh, and so probably it's not gonna work for, uh, at, at start, it's not gonna work for every possible crazy thing that Agda supports, but uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Is that when there is uh, soft arguments? Um, the rewrite rules. Well, I mean, so the ducty uh, rewrite rules do not have to be well typed, right? So you can just, you can, I mean, 
we have the information about whether an argument is forced and then you can just put an underscore there in the rewrite rule but uh, yeah so but um, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, that's a good thing to think about. What, what was the problem? Uh, about uh, forced arguments, ah. how to handle this. Uh, to be honest, I haven't really thought about it yet. Um, in the interest of time, um, I think I will give the word back to Tiago. He's going to talk about uh, uh, universe polymorphism. Thanks, so I'll try to do this a bit quicker than I had hoped for, but yeah, sorry, I think it's my fault. I ended up spending lots of time on other sections. So universe polymorphism. so sometimes we wish to use a definition at multiple levels. So for instance, uh, I would like to have list of natural numbers, but also list of types in set zero. So what is the bad solution to this? I can define manually a new list i for each level i, well, not for each one, but for some number of, let's say, 10. And then for each list i, I then need to redo, uh, redefine a map function, uh, head function, and everything. So uh, what universe polymorphism allows, which is, is then the good solution to this, uh, this problem, is to allow for definition to be used at multiple levels later. So that here I have the universe polymorphism, polymorphic definition of list, uh, in which the i here is just, uh, you can think of, 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 of like a, a free variable, you actually then have to apply to it. So uh, when you're using list, so, uh, and here you have the map function. So once again, I mean, you can pin, think of this as also as a narrow type. So you're abstracting, uh, quantifying over all possible uh, universe levels. And then you can define this in a general way such that after you can use that multiple uh, universe levels. Okay, so before continuing, let me just make a small note here. So uh, universe pronouncing in Agda is very different from what you have in Cox. So this is some of the difference. So the first thing that you're probably aware of is that uh, in Coq you have this typical ambiguity, so you don't have to write universal levels. But actually this is a minor problem because then you, you find them internally. So uh, this is more like of your problem of a user than from the problem of like when you're writing a, a translator. Uh, but what we have that is more significant is the fact that in Coq we have cumulativity, so the fact that uh, a, when a type is in set i, then it's also in set i plus one. So this means that the meta theory is a bit more uh, uh, complicated and encoding in the duct is a bit comp more complicated also. And I think that the main uh, dif dif the difference is the fact that uh, in Coq actually definitions will carry some constraints that you need to, to be checked at its usage. So. It's, it's not like uh, in, in Agd in which every term is itself uh, well typed, uh, but rather this definition will have to be instantiated with some concrete levels after, and then it will be, you see whether it's well typed uh, in this context. But well, this is uh, maybe a bit too technical, so I just wanted to mention this, and this talk will look at the Agd version of it, and if you're interested on the Coq version, you can look at Gaspar uh, Ferry uh, PhD thesis, which defended, uh, I guess, last year, yeah. or, yeah. So, uh, okay, so the idea here uh, of the encoding in, uh, in deductive is that we're going some way to generalize the encoding that we already had for the arrow type. So actually, yeah, before I'll, I'll define a new sort for universe polymorphic definition. So this is set omega. If you already used universe polymorphism in Agda, then you probably already know it. Uh, this, so this represents the set omega. Uh, and then I'm going to add this, uh, this for all constant, which is representing the quantification over universe levels. Uh, and what I'm saying, so I'll go a bit fast over this, but um, the, the, this, uh, this rewrite rule is just like the rewrite rule that we had before, identifying the representation of functions with the framework functions. Here it's similar, we're identifying the, so the elements of the for all as uh, functions which will take some universe level and 
to which one we will map uh, a term in a certain type. So for instance, this, this, as you see, there's a dependency on the universe level. So uh, this represents the fact that this definition, the resulting definition will live in a different universe depending, to, uh, depending on the i that you give here. Uh, yeah, so like I said, uh, an encoding is uh, both a theory and a translation function. So this is the, the translation function. Uh, yeah, so because we have this uh, rule identifying it with the arrow type of the dict, then just application with a level gets translated with in the framework's application and the same for uh, abstracting over universe levels. So just some examples so we, we can see uh, what this is actually. So for instance, the constant, which represents the type form of the list type, the universe polymorphic list type that we had seen before, we can represent it in the DECT with this type. So here we have the for all quantifying over all uh, universe levels. And then, uh, so here are the sort annotations as we had seen before. And then uh, note that the I here, so this is just everything that's from the prod until the end here is just uh, set I arrow set I. But note that here the I is being quantified. So this is the, the fact that this definition can be then, this will be, be able to be used at different I's later. And actually when applying the rewrite rules that we've already seen, this computes as expected to, uh, so it's a function which the, to the type of functions that uh, for each level, uh, uh, we will take then a, 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 a code in a, cert in a certain universe and then return uh, another code in the same universe. So this is the fact of if you use list at the type at the level one, so you take something of a type in set uh, one and then you return another type in set one. So you return, for instance, list of A if A is in set one. And yeah, so this is what we uh, were expecting. Uh, so yeah, so note that until now, I, I told you to not think about universe levels. These are just natural numbers, but this is actually the easy story. <laughs> and now we are going to enter a bit on the details. I'll have to be a bit fast, but yeah. Uh, so uh, the levels are given by the syntax here. So looks easy. Well, but the, the thing is that the levels are not freely generated, so they're going to satisfy some definitional equalities. So independence, uh, associativity, commutativity, distributivity, neutrality, and subsumption. So yeah, this is, uh, at the end, actually, universe levels are very particular uh, type of levels, a very particular type, because you have some very specific definition qualities. And uh, so this poses a challenge when representing universe polymorphies, because when we're trying to establish the encoding soundness, actually we won't be able to represent the definition of equality of the theory that I'm coding as a definition of equality of, of the framework of the duct. So we want this impl implication here. We need it to, to be able to prove this. So possible solutions representing levels as naturals well, maybe you already understood that this does not work because then closed terms will not satisfy all the equalities that you want if you just declare the usual rules which you would use to define the max function. Uh, then uh, this is the current solution. So you can represent levels as sets of variables with natural increments. We'll see this in a bit. And this works well, but there's a, a small catch that I'll explain a bit more on the next slide. And we, you can also think of other possibilities, like maybe having some simple decision procedure integrated in the DECTS. Yes. I think it was something that was also hinted at Bruno's talk yesterday. So uh, yeah, this is something we didn't explore, but I'll leave for the future generations. I think it's an interesting idea, uh, but yeah. So the current solution, uh, what is the intuition behind it is that each level admits a unique canonical form, well, unique modulo, some computation here, but the idea you can express it as a max of a natural number here. And each for each free variable appearing in L, you have this variable here with some natural increment. So this is a plus and yeah. 
and you have this technical condition here. So this form will be unique modulo, of course, the reordings that you put on the, like if you put, put the N at the, at the end of the list, then this won't change anything. And the idea is that we can use a rewrite system to calculate such forms by using uh, rewriting modulo associativity commutativity. Uh, so this means that we add uh, 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 rewriting modulo associativity commutativity means that we're going to declare a symbol as associative commutative and it will add to the equational, to the definitional uh, equality, the fact that it satisfies those two uh, identities. And then we, we do rewriting modulo this uh, yeah, uh, and so yeah, there's a catch, as I said, is that in the impotence and subsumption require a, a nonlinear rule because when you're taking a max and you have the same variable appearing two times, then actually you need to do to, to, to something to, to make it appear just one. And yeah, nonlinear rules, they're not a good idea because they break confluence on preterms and generally this prevents proving some better properties of the encodings. There are some uh, 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 some ways of handling this, but this is, yeah, non-linear non rules are a bit of a, of a pain, so yeah. And how do you make it uh, I mean, no, no, yeah, I'm sorry, you're not adding as a rewrite rule, that's the point. So uh, you're doing rewriting multiple days. So indeed, you cannot add uh, commutativity as a rewrite rule, otherwise uh, you're going to just exchange forever the two. So this is why, so associativity, you could add it as a rewrite rule, but uh, commut for commutativity, there are really no uh, easy way. So one of the uh, types of rewriting that is already well studied is rewriting associative, uh, uh, modular associative commutativity. So this is something that we have, for instance, in the implementation of the Ducty, and it's well studied, so we, we can use it here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so this ends my part on universe polymorphism, and I'm going to <laughs> run, so, because we don't have a lot of time. Okay, um, I have exactly zero minutes to explain uh, eta equality and uh, irrelevance, so I am uh, gonna yeah, go uh, very quickly and then leave the rest of it to uh, questions. But the one sentence summary is uh, we have eta equality in Agda, which is great. It supports um, eta equality for functions also eta equality for record types, such as the sigma type. And uh, in particular, it supports eta equality for the unit type, which is we don't have a good story yet how to handle this. Um, so uh, we have the, the unit type, right? So it's a record type with no constructors. Um, so it has exactly one element, TT. And uh, so eta for this type means that any two elements of this type are equal. So in particular, if we have two variables, they are equal. Uh, and this, uh, this means that yeah, uh, a, a, a lot of uh, type checking uh, algorithms do not deal well with this uh, kind of rule. Um, and in particular, uh, it does not suffice anymore if you want to check if two terms are equal, it does not suffice to just normalize them and compare their normal forms. Um, and, and we cannot really eta expand these uh, things. So, uh, yeah, so what, what, I mean, this is uh, two slides of bad solutions to the problem. Um, so eta expansion uh, while translating, um, well, first of all, it's not uh, stable under substitution. Um, I, I'm, I'm not gonna explain the details here uh, because of time. So we could eta reduce instead during the translation, uh, which is also not stable under substitution. Um, and then so we could instead think of well, not doing do it during the translation, but try to add eta equality to the meta theory. Uh, but the meta theory does not have record types, it only has a function types, so it only really handles eta equality for the arrow type. Um, so then we could try to eta reduce uh, 
terms of the theory as a rewrite rule. So instead of doing a train translation, you could try to do it as a rewrite rule. Uh, but this is, uh, well, first of all, you cannot have a eta reduction for the unit type, right? There's nothing to, to match on. Uh, and also you need nonlinearity again. So uh, Tiago explained why we don't want this. Um, and then finally, a solution that kind of works is, well, uh, but, but uh, it's not very nice, is, well, basically annotate terms with, with their types, right? And then uh, have, have this kind of eta annotation that says, well, when this type computes to a function type or to a record type, you want to eta expand this term, right? Uh, and then have, have free write rules for that. But um, yeah, so we get, obviously we get huge terms if you annotate everything with our types. And uh, also, um, yeah, these, uh, these rules, again, are uh, not uh, confluent on preterms. Uh, and, and, and moreover, so if you have a variable f, this is not anymore translated to a variable in the translation. So this is, this is not, not a nice solution. Um, so it would be nice, I think, uh, if we could actually do some type-directed things in uh, the duct itself. And um, in particular, uh, have some kind of uh, type-directed rules or type-directed conversion rules uh, in, uh, in the duct -y. Um And so in particular, this is how uh, Agda implements uh, eta equality. So we know that it, it would be sufficient to do it. Right? And also it's how um, uh, Andromeda 2 is implementing these uh, extensionality rules. Um, but I mean, we're also open to, I mean, I'm also open to other possible options. Uh, so. The, the thing is, we don't have, I don't think we have a satisfactory solution here at the moment. And then um, for, yeah, we also have uh, irrelevance for prop I mentioned, and basically is, is the same problem, right? So you can have two terms uh, that are, I mean, two variables that are definitionally equal. So f, x and y, here are type of some type in prop. Uh, so then they become equal, right? And it, it, it is basically the same problem. Um, okay, so to uh, go to the conclusion, right? Um, so there is uh, there are some good parts, there are some bad parts, there are some ugly parts, right? So um, we have uh, many features that can be encoded in a very straightforward way in uh, the Ducty because we actually have the proof terms in Agda um, and uh, it, the translation is just very straightforward, I think. So defined symbols are mapped to constants, clauses can be mapped to rewrite rules and it's uh, sound encoding. Um, other features require some more work, but there's not no fundamental problems. So we, for example, we need to reconstruct these uh, parameters to constructors. Um, and, and, and for universe levels, we needed to do some, uh, some work that uh, Tiago explained. Um, and then there are some features where we don't know yet. So in particular, eta equality and definitional proof relevance, I think, are in this category. Um, and uh, would be good to have uh, a better solution for that. Um, yeah, and then uh, for future work. So as you have noticed, this is still uh, very much a work in progress. Uh, so Tiago is at the moment working on the compilation of clauses to elimination principles. And uh, yeah, uh, so that's uh, to get uh, uh, more satisfactory encoding of uh, definitions by pattern matching. Um, so for universe polymorphism, um, well, the current encoding we have is not conservative. Uh, so it would be, yeah, th th there's still room for a, a better encoding there. Um, then, um, yeah, Tiago was also working on something else. So uh, this is, uh, you mentioned in the beginning, so it's not an adequate encoding yet. So uh, if you want to do an adequate encoding, we need to add some more information to the terms. And uh, yeah, um, he's giving a talk about that at FSCD. So if you're interested, uh, check that out. And then uh, finally, as I mentioned, uh, eta equality and irrelevance. Yeah. So with that, uh, I'm seven minutes late. Um, so I think that's uh, hopefully not 
too much. Um, there's uh, some references if you want to learn more. And of course, you can get uh, Agnoti Deducti from the Deduct team repository and uh, play with it yourself. So, thank you. Yeah, any? Right. So at the, yeah, for this talk, we've mostly focused so far on uh, just having a signed encoding of Agda, so being able to recheck uh, Agda files and making sure that they are correct. Um, so um, if you actually want to do this, then yeah, you would have to find uh, some kind of uh, encoding of your data types, right? That can be then mapped to the Cock representation of data types. Maybe you should uh, collect yeah. some information that repeat, like the fact that this is this constant represents the type one, and, and that this uh, constant is a type, uh, is a constructor of a certain yeah. type. And I, I think that the work on uh, eliminating, uh, on implementing the translation from Python machine is particularly interesting because in Agda, so as we saw, so functions are defined by closures. So if you just have some closures, you cannot define directly a, a stuff. Function where in every uh, uh, push a sequence based on type three, we al always have an elimination principle. So if we have push and terms which are defined using directly those, we can just take the elimination principles in constant and use it as a term. But indeed, there's some information that needs to be kept if we go into to, to another specific. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just by I guess you're talking about the, the positive, positive uh, coincidence yeah. types of stuff. So yeah, yeah. I'm not playing with those. <laughs> yeah. Um, or. Yeah. yeah. So one one other solution would be to go through a, a universe of data types, right? So there's uh, work uh, on uh, encoding uh, universes of uh, data types, and actually, uh, so my PhD student uh, Lucas Escott has an ICFP paper this year on uh, encoding a large class of uh, Agda data types so, uh, in, uh, as, as, a, as a universe, right? So that would be one. So if, if you can then implement that same universe in Coxe, right? Then you can uh, do the translation via that. Yes, that would be, yeah. And then, you have to have and then you have, maybe you can, I mean, maybe not every proof assistant would support this full universe, but you could define a predicate of, for each system, right? This is the class of, uh, of data types that this supports. Yeah. Um, At the moment, that's the main goal, yeah, yes. Because okay. we do it at the level where beta rules are always being applied, right? Because the internal syntax presentation has the beta rule of one more. Yeah. So basically, we're not catching any bugs that might happen during the applying those beta rules. Uh, that's correct, yes. I mean, you could re-implement the elaboration of Agda, I guess, in as as a as a rewrite system in the Ducty, but that's that you would you, that's a much bigger. Uh, then you would start from the abstract syntax. So if I go back to uh, to the slide, yeah. So you would you would you could branch off even earlier, right? You could branch off from the abstract syntax and then write some kind of elaboration yourself that. Targets. Yeah, but that's much harder because 
That's much harder, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, it's just an invariant that we enforce at the moment, but mm -hmm. otherwise we would have to call reduction in more places maybe. But, uh, but I hope that it, this might uh, give the false impression that we're not using computation in the system, but we're still using it because when you're type checking everything, then you're doing like uh, on the application rule, you have some substitution going in and then you have the conversion rule. So yeah. Yeah, and, and even, I mean, also, yeah, you can maybe apply a function definition and then you get a beta redux, so then that has, still has to be reduced by deducting, right? So it's not that all beta reduction has already happened. Yeah. And the second question is, what about the uh, rewrite rules that you can add to Pipedrive? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so in theory, these are quite similar to what we have in deducting. Uh, so with the main difference, again, that they use... Uh, uh, a typed matching algorithm, right? So to deal with uh, eta equality for record types mm -hmm. um, properly. Um, so some of those maybe could be um, implemented. Yes, implemented in it a, could like, be yeah. implemented yeah. in a very similar way. Yeah, you could map them to rewriters in the duct. Yeah. yeah. So then, I mean, so as long as you're not relying on eta equality for records, it would uh, be a sound translation, I think. Yeah. By using typed conversion? So essentially, that means that in Acta you will have the kernel struct, right? No, so uh, the reduction is not uh, typed, right? So we can reduce untyped syntax in Acta, but the conversion, so if we're comparing two types, two, two terms, then we always have to know what type are we comparing them at. Well, it's it's like uh, it's it's uh, alternation between rewriting both sides of the equation, which is untyped, and then uh, looking at the type. Uh, so we rewrite to we get normal form, and then we look at the type to uh, to see um, how, how how they compare at that type. Uh, but you should uh, check uh, Anya's paper uh, on this because this is a very nice uh, uh, very nice general framework for this kind of. Uh, conversion checkings. So maybe that should it should somehow be done. That needs to be reflected in feedback loops. Yes. So that's that's one other solution, yeah. right? If you don't want to extend the ducty, you could do a kind of a deeper embedding, right? You could have a, de you define the syntax of uh, then you can define the conversion checker as a rewrite system. You can always uh, use the ducty as a programming language. Yeah. Like yeah, but 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 the goal here is to have a kind of a shallow embedding, right? And then. Uh, yeah, then I, I mean, in some sense, in some sense, from the original type theory, of course, one could almost say, uh, in what is it, type theory, the judgment is S equals T of type A. Yes. Not S equals type A. Well, yeah, but I think so this is. Yeah, this is the essential difference maybe between uh, MLTT and CIC that, uh, uh, in a sense, or one of the big differences that was mentioned yesterday, I think. Yeah. Like the PTS -like representation yeah. So in an MLTT we have typically, or in Agda-like systems, we have typed conversion and in uh, Cox and CIC we have uh, untyped conversion. Can you comment or? Uh. Uh, I mean, so maybe a, a question, a, a venture raised up in this. So the, the previous PhD student who worked on this, so he he got a quarter of the of the library of uh, American deductive. So by doing this, I guess he had some uh, of the standard library, of course. He had some performance numbers, but. 
the first thing that I did when I started my PhD was to bring everything to <laughs> 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 the modified something. So yeah. uh, I don't have really some but, numbers on, on but how long yeah. it takes or on the centralizing things like that because I'm trying to like. So. Yeah, Guillaume, he, he was using these uh, type annotations to support eta equality, I think. So that was, uh, yeah, quite. A comment to Adam Mankata yeah. also. What do you mean by performance? Do you mean to translate or to recheck? To both? Because rechecking, so we have, uh, as I explained uh, yesterday, so we have uh, three different checkers. And if you take a component curl check, it's written in Rust and it's very efficient. So we, we can uh, check uh, files of uh, uh, hundreds of megabytes uh, directly. So it's not a problem for uh, rechecking. Yeah, but maybe you could answer whether uh, rechecking the part of the app library uh, takes minutes, years, centuries. <laughs> I think <laughs> it's. Even if you don't have the exact figure, it's uh, the order of yeah. magnitude. Yeah, I don't think that the only. Sometimes during his PhD he's just waiting for the answer, but I think that's less than a year. But <laughs> 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 uh, so yeah, I don't have uh, exact numbers. I don't know. More than a minute, less than a year. Okay, good. <laughs> 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 so, so how does it compare with type checking in Rust? Then? Takes it much longer? Yeah, I don't think we have done a formal uh, yeah, comparison. Not a fair com comparison, because actually, like when translating it. We, we go through Agda, right? So everything is type tag. We go into the internal syntax where everything has already been type yeah. tag. So the translation itself, it's type tag in Agda. It, it, it does the type tag yeah. in Agda. So, yeah. Yeah, but some of the comparison was you have some Agda code, you type check it. You have the tra translated code, which of course was yeah. after, after all this performance, etc. Okay. So not and you check this. Because that would actually happen if you have, uh, let's say, a big library uh, uh, and you make a small modification, then usually um. you don't change anything in there. Yeah. So you would really, the comparison would be the type check actor versus, uh, generally, the, uh, mm. uh, the type C after, after, which makes use, of course, of the type check. Mm. Maybe maybe we can take the discussion offline because I see it's uh, we're really going uh, very much over time already. So yes. um, let's continue the discussion at the yes, break. Yes, exactly. Uh, but